Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So today's lecture is about the history of central banks and the philosophies which guide the actions of central banks. So there are some periods uh, starting from early times. The nature and function of central banking has changed and we will look at these. So very early in the 17th century, uh, there was a cluster of exchange banks. These were banks in um, different uh, trading centers and the basic purpose of these banks were that uh, people could trade across countries without having to carry money with them. They would be able to transfer money from their bank to overseas to buy things from or to other countries to buy things without having to go and without having to carry money which would be a risky transaction. So these so called exchange banks, so uh, these were allowed people to send money and to bring back money. These eventually became central banks and we will use the term uh, high finance which is also called haute finance or French and this has been called uh, the money lenders. So these were uh, very powerful institutions because they had access to a huge amount of money. So I'm going to teach you today about the Bank of England, which is the mother of all central banks, which was formed in 1694. This is a very strange and interesting story, very few people know. First, in 1600, uh, money lenders were driven out of England and out of m most places. Queen Elizabeth, uh, basically the money lenders were um, uh, in a way in control of the money supply because they would be able to uh, provide gold to anybody who wanted. So uh, by providing these loans, they created the money supply. So they were uh, driven out and Queen Elizabeth actually issued uh, metal coins which were uh, made of metal which was itself worthless or worth very little and she said that this is legal tender. All other coins were cancelled that you have, uh, you can't use any other coin. This action was challenged in the courts and the court ruled that it was the sovereign's right to create money and nobody else had that right. So they supported Queen Elizabeth uh, and it was treason for anyone else to create it. But the merchant classes, uh, the goldsmiths and the financiers, they uh, did not like this at all because the privilege of money creation was taken away from them. So basically they worked to get rid of this. So one way to do this was that um, they funded uh, revolts against the kings and in particular the Cromwell succeeded in carrying out a successful revolution which was financed by these money lenders. The money lenders gave the uh, loan to the parliament. Cromwell, basically it was a battle between the uh, king and the uh, upper classes who were in the parliament. And this has always been the case that the kings uh, are against the upper classes because the upper classes are, are, are always trying to take the kingship away from him. And so the king has a natural alliance with the poor. And that is why um, attempts at privatization, the so-called commons, uh, this was large amounts of forests and rivers and lakes which were uh, common property, everybody could use them. And for a long time, aristocrats had been wanting to acquire this. So this is our own personal right, our, our, the whole village belongs to us and the kings had prevented this from happening because they did not want more power being given to the aristocrats. But anyway, 
So the money lenders exploited this uh, natural split and they funded, uh, they provided financing to the parliament uh, for in return for two conditions that the loans would be guaranteed, they would receive prepayment for them and that the finances would be allowed to operate once again when they had been banned. So um, Cromwell carried out a successful re uh, um, revolution and then Charles was actually captured and uh, the king uh, and tried and executed so that he would not to make sure that he doesn't return to power because if he had come to power, then he would have um, not allowed all of this to happen. So after Cromwell died, there was no particular head of that revolution which had been launched. So the um, parliament uh, and the um, financiers offered to give him back the kingship, but in the process, uh, they made sure that uh, his hands would be tied in many different ways. One of the things was that the privilege of issuing money was uh, given to the parliament as well as the taxation privilege. Uh, there was the Free Coinage Act of 1666 which meant that anybody who brought in gold or silver uh, to the mint that would be converted into money so that anybody could create money out of the um, gold and silver. This was a very powerful instrument because basically it gave the power of uh, money creation to the private sector. And of course, uh, it's only to the rich that it makes a difference. So, uh, King William III is an important um, figure in this. He started out as a Dutch aristocrat. The most powerful of the exchange banks was the um, Amsterdam Whistle Bank. And this was the one which financed King William, Dutch moneylenders. Uh, first, they arranged his marriage to Prince Mary, Princess Mary of York. Then James was removed from power, and William and Mary became the joint rulers in 1689. And then uh, soon, there was the Nine Years' War with uh, France. For this purpose, he needed uh, money, which he got in return for giving, creating the Bank of England. Uh, so basically, English, England was defeated by France, which who had the bigger navy in 1690, and so England had to borrow money in order to build a man, new. Uh, new um, navy. But King William had no money and so it could not borrow the 1.2 million pounds that they wanted. Basically the powers of the king at that point were through the parliament in order to raise this he would have had to put in taxes and that was not really feasible and the parliament was not uh, very much uh, going along with him. In fact, it denied him funds when he asked them. The Bank of England was formed to provide 1.2 million pounds to the king to allow him to carry out this war. And how this was done, this is very important to understand. He said that, okay, um, we are going to form a company, which is the governor and company of the Bank of England, the uh, anybody who is a stockholder in this company, basically you buy stocks in this company, that is the money that the king will get. So that's the loan. And anybody who buys stocks, he will earn the 8% return that the king is offering. Actually there was... Um, so now, um, so far so good, but uh, the bank that is going to be created will be allowed to issue money. Uh, basically, uh, they said, okay, you give us paper saying that I owe you, the king will give us a paper, I owe you 1.2 million pounds and I promise to pay 8% per annum on it. And uh, the bank said that you don't have to pay it back. Yani, all you do is you pay me the 8%. Uh, 
and also uh, you don't need to raise 8% I will do it on your behalf by collecting taxes so but huh, the, the key thing is that this money this IOU of the government I will be able to write notes on it. I will say this, I have 1.2 million pounds of the king's money and I can use this as notes to do whatever I want. So if I say that, okay, I have 1 million pounds here, I'm going to buy this company, here are my notes. What is this note? This note is an IOU by the king. So actually it was not the IOU by the king, but it was a note which was backed by the IOU of the king. So basically they got the money uh, this is called monetization of the debt. They got the power to create money. The money, the money that was created was backed by the word of the king. That is all. So these ba Bank of England would issue bank notes that would circulate as the national paper currency. The bank, no uh, bank would create bank notes out of nothing, and um, only a fraction of them would be backed by gold. Actually. Uh, but basically it would mainly be backed by the government IOU. Now, so if you circulate these notes and um, people say that, okay, give me, um, I want to get gold. Well, it's not technically backed by gold, but the, uh, but it's backed by a king's promise to pay gold. So it should have some value. So the bank said that, okay, yes, we will redeem these notes in gold. So, um, even though it's backed by the king's IOU, the king doesn't have money, but we will uh, act as the intermediary. That is what, what is meant. You see, the king, technically what happened was, what, what should have happened was that the banks gave 1.2 million gold to the king, but they did not. They just said, okay, wh whenever you need, we will give you the gold as required. So now they have, they have 1.2 million pounds and they have promised to redeem this debt for gold as required. So whenever somebody came in and said, okay, I want to get gold for this pound, they would give him the gold. But they didn't need as much gold as 1.2 million pounds because if people are confident that the gold is there, then they don't demand it. The lenders would be allowed to secure payment on the national debt by direct taxation of the people. So the 8%, not the principal 1.2 million, but the 8% per annum that was due that they collected by putting taxes on the people and goods. So this is the model in which most central banks have been based. It was privately owned by stockholders from its foundation in 1694 until it was nationalized in, in 1946. So basically the Bank of England, which seemed to everybody to be a government bank, is actually owned by financiers. It's not owned by the government of England. And this is the case for most central banks. So how did the Bank of England provide one point? Did they have 1.2 million pounds in gold? No, actually what is very strange if you think about it technically is uh, it, it makes no sense. I mean your head becomes very puzzled. The Bank of the King uh, writes an IOU to the Bank of England saying that I owe you 1.2 million dollars and now the bank prints 1.2 million pounds as uh, in bank notes which are backed by this uh, IOU and these uh, he says okay here's your 1.2 million pounds so basically the uh, bank is providing the money that the king <laughs> the king uh, on the basis of the IOU that the king so basically it's giving back to the king what the king gave to uh, the bank it's a very puzzling transaction but uh, we will see why this how this happened so now the bank provided bullion so as needed I will provide you gold this is part of the uh, but not 1.2 million gold bars to sit in your castle uh, gold bars are with me, but I will provide them as needed. So technically, the king can ask for 1.2 million in gold, but the king doesn't want 1.2 million gold. He wants to make sure that any payments that he makes are honored. So the bank now, the king can write checks or can give these notes. As these notes have the property that, in principle, 
anybody can take these notes to the bank and get gold for them. So this is something that the king cannot do. He does not have any gold, but the bank can. So that's why uh, this trade can be done. It is now authorized to issue currency backed by gold or by government debt. It can redeem the liability of the government. This is how modern state bank works. The government writes a check and anybody can present it to the central bank and the central bank will cash it uh, by, actually of course there is no gold involved anymore, but it will de provide, uh, deposit uh, an electronic entry in your bank account if you if you present it with the government obligation. And it can also collect taxes on behalf of the government if uh, the government owes the bank. So this is not true anymore for our banks. 